We're going to calculate <coughs> excuse me, the vector potential of a magnetic dipole in two different ways. It's going to be the, um, the approximate potential, or I will show you the full um, form which cannot be solved analytically. Um, so a magnetic dipole is a small current loop, um, and we're going to put it at the origin for the sake of simplicity. So we're going to draw ourselves a set of axes as per usual. Um, here's Z, here's X, here's Y. And our current loop is going to be here at the origin. Um, it's going to have radius A. Um, it will carry a current I flowing around it. Um, we are going to observe it at a point R1 um, up here. And if we choose to use cylindrical polar coordinates, then this distance um, in the xy plane will be R and the, um, the vertical distance, of course, will be Z. Um, the point on the current loop, which we're going to be taking around in a circle, um, is the point R2. Um, and the angle between um, R1 and R2 is theta, uh, at least in the first part. Um, it'll, it'll be theta as well later on, but that'll be a slightly more approximate version. So we know that we can write in general um, the vector potential A at a point R1 is mu naught over 4 pi uh, multiplied by the volume integral of the current density J um, at R2 divided by R21 dV2. Um, I showed this. This comes from writing B as curl A and then using the Coulomb gauge. Um, that then gives you a, a, a solution as we've written down. And if we have a current loop, we can write that as mu naught i over 4 pi. And we place the volume integral um, of the current density with a loop integral. And of course, the loop has to be carrying a constant current. So we have the loop integral dl2 divided by r21. So that's the physical setup. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use a multipole expansion. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the, the formal derivation um, of the multipole again, um, because we've done that for the electric dipole. Um, so what we're going to do uh, is expand, uh, again, 1 over R21 in powers of um, 1 over R1. Um, and when we do that, we, see we, we, can, we can write the following. We see that A at R1. Um, is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi. And then we have a sum over n is equal to 0 to infinity um, of 1 over r1 to the n plus 1. And then we have a loop integral of r2 to the power n multiplied by pn of cos theta. And this is dl2. So that's just a standard um, expansion of 1 over R21, the standard multiple approach. Um, let's write out the first few terms and see where we get to. So we see that that's mu naught i over 4 pi. Um, and then we're going to do a curly bracket. And we've got a, a 1 over R1. So this is for n equal naught. And we've got the closed loop integral of dl2 uh, plus a 1 over R1 squared. And we have now the closed loop integral of R2 cos theta dl2. Um, we'll put in the next term as well just for now. 1 over r1 cubed closed loop integral of r2 squared into 3 over 2 cos theta minus a half dl. And I'll put plus dot 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 and I'll do a very squashed closed curly bracket. OK, so we've got the first three terms. Um, this first term here, let's do this in a different colour, um, is going to go to zero because the closed loop integral um, is just giving us zero. That's the monopole term. We have asserted that there are no monopoles um, as far as we are aware. Therefore, it makes sense that that term should be zero. Um, so let's consider just the, the first uh, non-zero term, which is the, the dipole term. Um, and let's note a couple of things. So. First of all, we note that um, R2 cos theta is equivalent to R1 hat dotted with R2. That's um, 
just straightforward vector dot product, um, and then we'll also use um, a, a useful little transformation um, which allows us to write the, the closed loop integral of r1 hat dotted with r2 dl2 as equal to um, minus r1 hat crossed with the surface integral ds2. Um, and that's fiddly but relatively straightforward to show. Um, so when we do that, and if we drop the, the, the quadrupole term, then we find that the, the dipole term, so the first term in the magnetic vector potential, is written as um, mu naught i over 4 pi 1 over r1 squared uh, times the surface integral of ds2 crossed with r1 hat. Um, and now we're going to define um, a magnetic dipole moment m, which is going to be the current multiplied by the area squared, and it's going to be in the z direction because that's normal to the current loop. Um, and so our dipole becomes mu naught i over 4 pi m crossed with r1 hat over r1 squared. Um, and you can also write that as mu naught i a squared over 4 sine theta over r1 squared in the i phi direction. Um, that's just substituting in for m and evaluating the direction. That is a standard result for the vector potential of a magnetic dipole loop, um, a magnetic dipole which is a current loop near the origin. Um, of course it only applies when you're far away from the dipole because it is only the first term in the expansion. We can derive the full potential um, geometrically, uh, and I'll do that now. Um, it gets a little bit algebraic, but it shouldn't be too bad. So we start again with a at r1 is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi, and you have a closed loop integral of dl2 over r21. Now dl2 um, is just given as d phi 2 a into minus sine of phi 2 in the x direction uh, plus cos of phi 2 in the y direction using i and j for y, x and y. Um, notice that a actually by symmetry um, must equal a phi um, at r1 in the i phi direction. Um, that's, there, there's nothing else, no other shape it can have, um, just from the geometry and the symmetry of the problem. And we can write i phi um, in a similar way as minus sine of phi 1 i plus cos of phi 2 j. Um, and then we can take a dot product of i phi with a in order to pull out the a phi component. So when we do that we have a phi of r1 is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi closed loop integral of dl2 over r21 dotted with i phi. Um, now when we dot dl2 and i phi then we get the following. Um, we get mu naught i over 4 pi um, and then we get a closed loop integral of d phi 2 a um, cos of phi 2 minus phi 1, um, and that cos of phi 2 minus phi 1 simply comes um, because we're going to have sine phi 2, sine phi 1, cos phi 2, cos phi 1, so we end up with the sum of those, um, and that just reduces to cos of phi 2 minus phi 1 using a standard double angle formula. Now, let's think about um, what value of phi 1 we want to take. It doesn't actually matter because the final result cannot depend on phi 1, so we're going to set phi 1 equal to naught. Okay, so if a, because it has cylindrical symmetry about the z-axis, um, the value of a cannot depend on where we are. So having set phi 1 to 0, you find that a phi of r1 is equal to mu naught i a over 4 pi integral between 0 and 2 pi of cos phi 2 over r21 d phi 2. And at this point it looks like we are 
heading for a nice simple answer. Unfortunately, um, that is not the case. This is this becomes um, a, a an integral which can be tabulated numerically but cannot be solved, um, and that's because r two one depends on phi two. So it's a little bit of geometry, but you can show quite easily the following: that r two one is equal to r minus a cos phi two squared. So that's the difference in x plus a squared sine squared of phi 2, that would be the difference in y plus z squared um, to the half, and then that is equal to um, r squared plus a squared plus z squared minus 2a r cos phi 2 to the half. And remember, um, as I said just now, we're evaluating this at phi 1 equals 0. Of course, that is um, on the x-axis, which is why we have this particular form. So we can substitute that in, um, and we find the following. We find that a phi is equal to mu naught i a over 4 pi. Uh, we have the integral between 0 and 2 pi of cos phi 2 d phi 2 divided by r squared plus a squared plus z squared minus 2a r cos phi 2 to the half. Um, and this is what is known as um, an elliptical integral, or it can actually be written in terms of the sum of two elliptical integrals, um, which cannot be solved numerically, um, or sorry, cannot be solved analytically, but can be evaluated numerically. Um, and I will put up a Jupyter notebook which plots um, the, the exact solution for the magnetic field of a dipole based on um, the numerical implementation of elliptical integrals, They're a standard part of all numerical libraries. Um, I've taken them from SciPy, Scientific Python, but you can get them in many other places. Um, so, okay, we can't solve this analytically. We're going to make an approximation and we'll see what we can pull out. Um, so our approximation is simply to assume um, that the bottom of the, uh, the integral here can be split into a large thing, which is r squared plus a squared plus z squared, and a small thing, 2ar cos phi 2. Um, I've just realised that that should be a cos phi 2, not a cos phi squared. Um, there we go. Okay, so now we're going to assume that r squared plus a squared plus z squared is greater than, very much greater than, 2ar cos phi 2. Um, this is something that is generally true in the far field when r squared plus z squared is greater than a squared. Remember, a is the radius of the current loop. So if r squared plus z squared, which is the distance away from the current loop, is larger than a squared, you're far away. Um, you can also show that if you've got a squared plus z squared is larger than r squared, um, then that's also true. That'll be on near the axis, but not too close to the current loop. Um, and it's standard to evaluate um, fields near the axis as well as far away. So when we've done that, um, we can write the following expansion. You have r21 to the minus 1 is going to equal r squared plus a squared plus z squared to the minus a half um, into 1 minus 2a r cos phi 2 over r squared plus a squared plus z squared to the minus a half. I should really have given r squared plus a squared plus z squared its own symbol, um, but there we are. That's then equal to r squared plus a squared plus z squared to the minus a half. And we're going to expand out to first order and say that's 1 plus a r cos phi 2 over r squared plus a squared plus z squared. So again, we're doing 1 plus delta to the power n is approximately equal to 1 plus n delta. Absolutely standard expansion. Put that back in and we see jumping the gun a little bit there, um, that a phi is equal to mu naught i a over 4 pi, integral from 0 to 2 pi, um, and now we've pulled the cos phi outside and it's only in the numerator. We've got cos phi 2 over r squared plus a squared plus z squared into 1 plus a r 
cos phi 2 over r squared plus a squared plus z squared um, d phi 2. And we'll now use a couple of simple trigonometrical identities. The integral from 0 to 2 pi of cos phi d phi is of course equal to naught. Uh, and the integral from 0 to 2 pi of cos squared phi d phi, um, you do that by substituting, so it's integral from 0 to 2 pi of a half into 1 plus cos 2 phi d phi, and that works out to be pi. And therefore, we see that a phi is equal to mu naught i over 4 a squared r over r squared plus a squared plus z squared to the three halves. Um, but this note is in cylindrical polar coordinates. Um, so what we can do is we can then, then convert that to spherical polars. Um, a conversion here is that r is equal to r sine theta um, and little r is equal to the square root of r squared plus z squared. And when we do that, we see that we get the same formula we had above, mu naught i a squared over 4 sine theta over r squared. Um, I've made in that last line the assumption that r squared plus z squared is larger than a squared, just to simplify things. Of course, it's not surprising that we get the same answer by doing two different approximations and expansions. Um, it's just nice to see that making the simple first order approximation um, gives us the same basic answer. It shows it was not a bad approximation. Um, we'll use this later on. Um, and if you look at um, the notes, you can see the full magnetic field written out as a formula in spherical polars. And I'll put up a notebook which shows you the fields and the potential. Um, which you can play around with and compare the approximate with the exact and see where the differences lie.